Okay, so with that in mind, I want to take us straight up to uh, looking at the Great Depression, the big one. Okay, we've talked about a little bit about kind of the raw data of the Great Depression, but now let's look at some specific numbers for the U.S. economy. And let's look at this in terms of changes in real GDP. Okay, now what I have here is the level of real GDP, then I've calculated the percent change. That's my blue number. Inflation, what I've got here is the GDP deflator price level, and I've calculated the percent change. And then nominal GDP, which is simply total nominal spending in the economy. Okay, remember GDP is based on price times quantity of final goods. Well, nominal GDP is total nominal spending and it's spent on final goods. Okay, so nominal GDP is total final spending. And I've calculated that percent change as well. But what I want to show you here is that the calculated percent change is always going to be very close to simply adding up the change in real output, the percent change in real output, plus the percent change in the price level. So let's take this, let's take 1919 right here where we've got, let's call that a 1% move in real output, and let's call that a 2.5% move. We should have something about a 3.5%, a little less than 3.5%. Okay, when I add those up, see, there it is, about 3.25. The actual data on nominal GDP is going to agree very closely with that. It's about 3.29. Okay, just take another random year. Let's take 1925. Our change in real GDP is 2.3 or so. Our inflation rate's 1.8. Add those up. It's going to be just over 4. It's about 4.2. There it is right there. Okay, and notice how the, how my calculated, my estimated nominal, total nominal spending growth here basically agrees almost perfectly with the with the nominal GDP data. Okay, so I put this one over here just to show you that I'm not making these things up. Okay, this is real data and it tells a real story. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look then at the Great Depression. The time period we're interested in here is the year 1929. The peak of the previous business cycle occurred in about mid-1929. And then the trough, the GDP bottomed out, unemployment spiked in 1933. Okay, what's going on here? We'll take it, let's take a look at the depth of the depression. Let's take a look at 1932. Real GDP is crumbling. It's decreasing at a 13% rate, minus 13% growth. Prices are going down something close to 12%, massive deflation here in the Great Depression, which means total nominal spending is just cratering. It's just collapsing. Okay, something like minus 25, minus 24, minus 25. You see again that actual nominal GDP data is pretty close. So sometimes there's a little discrepancy up and down, but that number is pretty close to this number. So what, we're, what we've got to explain here, now this just illustrates that we still need to explain it, but we'll be able to interpret it pretty easily. Actually, thanks to uh, the work of some great economists and some economic historians who have uh, looked into the data and tried to figure out what's going on here. But in, t in terms of the business cycle model, what we're looking for is a massive decline in total nominal spending, okay, which reached a peak rate of minus 25%. But you'll notice for all of these depression years, we have some, anything from very severe to a little more mild, but still negative okay, declines in total nominal spending. In other words, what we just talked about, what we just classified in the terms of the Keynesian business cycle model as big negative aggregate demand shocks. Okay, so what are those negative aggregate demand shocks? Well, let me take you back for a minute to uh, our textbook, a little table here that talks about the main categories of positive and negative aggregate demand shocks. The top three here are going to be the, the big ones, the key ones, to understanding uh, most of our historical episodes. We're going to look at money shocks. Okay, a faster growth rate would be a positive shock. Of course, we're looking at negative shocks because we're looking at a depression. We're looking at a massive decline in total nominal spending or aggregate demand. Okay, so we're going to look for money shocks. We're going to look for confidence shocks. Okay, things that um, reduce business uh, people's confidence in, especially in investment spending, because they're not confident that uh, sales are going to be strong enough to justify investment and in new capital, new buildings, and hiring new people. Okay, and we can also look at wealth effects. And I'm going to rank them in this order. I'm going to say, where, whereas we might see things like confidence and wealth effects at the beginning of the recession, the, the big shocks we're going to see are going to be money shocks. Okay, and we'll look at that here in the next couple slides. First off, we, we might identify what we call a wealth shock. 
And this is kind of the, the popular tales of what started the Great Depression is the stock market crash in 1929. Okay, what we're looking at here is the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index, which is a most probably the most familiar stock market index. Okay, it's, a, it's the 30, sometimes they're called uh, blue chips, 30 of the biggest companies in the country, the biggest, strongest, most stable companies in the country. And although the composition of the index has changed uh, since then, it's basically been a pretty good snapshot of basically the top 30 stocks, uh, top 30 corporate issues in the U.S. economy. Okay, you can see, and that's hard to see down here, but the beginning date is 1920, 21, and then we go to 1929. Here's our peak in 1929. The Dow peaks at 380. Okay, and then bam, it starts to fall in late 1929. And this actually bounces around a little bit, but it just keeps on going down, down, down. And it really craters into the early 1930s, and it bottoms out all the way at 41. Okay, a massive decline. We go from 380 to 41. That's the value of the stock index. That's kind of a composite value. It's an indexed value of the top 30 companies in the U.S. Massive decline of something like 90%. Of something like 90%. Now, not a lot of Americans owned stocks back then. Uh, a lot, lot more people own stocks now, especially with things like 401ks and uh, retirement accounts. And that wasn't so common back then. Only a tiny fraction of the population owned stock. But what kind of people are stock owners? They're going to tend to be more high net worth people, wealthier people. How do you become wealthy, high net worth in an, in an economy like the U.S. economy? That's right, you're an entrepreneur, okay, you're in business. We don't have some kind of aristocracy that's just holding a bunch of wealth, okay. People get rich in this country by and large by being successful in business. So we're talking about a massive loss of wealth for entrepreneurs, okay, for the capitalist class. And will that reduce their ability to spend on consumption goods? Of course, will it reduce their ability and willingness to invest in future business endeavors? Well, it doesn't have to by itself, but a lot of economists are going to argue that it definitely will put them in less of a mood to invest, especially if it kind of carries over to, to impair the confidence of the rest of the economy. Okay. So we might view this as kind of something that kicks off aggregate demand effects in the Great Depression. There's a little bit of debate about this, but it's, it's definitely a massive uh, shock. Okay, where we're really going to see though the economic effect is going to be in investment. And what this chart is here, gross domestic uh, investment, gross private domestic investment, 1929 to 1939. So we're looking at the decade of the Great Depression. And you'll notice here that investment was $91 billion in 1929, a very healthy number, okay, a very large number, almost 10% of GDP. And what happens as the depression gains steam is this number just falls off precipitously. And again, here we're going to see something very similar to the stock market, not surprisingly. We're going to see something like a minus 90% decline. Actually, it's something like an 80% decline, 80-90% decline in investment spending. Okay. Now remember, investment, remember that Keynesian arithmetic with investment, Y equals consumption plus investment plus government purchases, plus net exports. Okay. Investment was about 10% before the Depression. Consumption, I don't have these numbers at hand. I'm just going to guesstimate it was 75. Government purchases, maybe 10, probably less than that. Okay, And then exports, maybe another 5. Okay. You might think, oh, investment, if it tapers off, it's only a small fraction of GDP, it won't matter that much. But look, if we lose almost all of the investment, we're basically losing all of it. We're, we, should, we can expect, okay, we've basically wiped out investment, and consumption's going to come down a little bit as well. Okay, and the exports, um, they might come down a little, government might come down a little, but look, we've basically lost all of investment. So you might expect GDP to come down 10%. Okay, it's actually going to come down quite a bit more than 10%. Investment comes down quite a bit as well. Okay. You can see here that even though it's small, it's very volatile. Okay, And if it, it loses all of its value, it's going to have a noticeable effect on GDP. Okay, So we've got a confident shock. This is best captured in this investment statistic. Finally, however, and a lot of economists who have studied this say, we, we've seen... 
big uh, stock market crashes before then and after then. We've seen big fluctuations in the investment numbers, but we've never seen such a massive, such a prolonged decline in GDP. Remember, the GDP went down something about a third over that four-year time period. We've never seen that before. That's crazy. We've seen big swings in the stock market. We've seen big swings in investment numbers and never associated with that kind of just utter collapse of GDP. Well, Milton Friedman, you'll see this. Uh, this is sourced here. Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz. Um, we've, we've heard of Friedman before. It's associated with uh, reviving the quantity theory of money and explaining inflation. Anna Schwartz was another well-regarded economist uh, who worked with Friedman at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And they researched what happened to the money supply in the U.S. economy in the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s. And what they discovered is that the money supply actually declined precipitously during the Great Depression as well. Okay. And the money supply, you'll notice back here in the late 20s, it was growing at something like 5% per year. Okay. And what, what does this mean? Well, remember, MV okay, equals PY. Or let's look at the growth rate, delta M over M plus delta V over V equals delta P equals inflation plus delta Y over Y. What does this mean again? The growth in money plus the growth in velocity equals the growth in inflation plus the growth in output. Velocity we can hold constant, so we can focus on money as the big mover and shaker on this side of total nominal spending or aggregate demand. Okay, And what this says is basically, look, you can have a nice steady growth in the economy. Let's say our real growth rate is 4%, which it had been in the late 1920s. Our inflation rate is actually about zero. Okay. Velocity is stable. It's not really changing. It's zero. So what kind of money growth would we need to accommodate that kind of economic growth? We would need about 4% money growth to accommodate 4% growth in output without having prices change. Okay. What happens, and look, that's what we have in the late 1920s, 4 or 5% growth in money accommodates 4 to 5% growth in output with stable price levels with no inflation. And that's viewed as actually a very a healthy economic outcome. But look what starts to happen when the depression kicks in. Okay, here's the stock market crash right here in late 1929. And after that, the money supply will start to tumble. Okay, the growth rate goes below zero and it then it goes precipitously below zero. And by the depth of the depression in 32, we've got the money supply declining by 15%. Velocity is probably actually going down here as well, but we'll just leave that fixed for now for simplicity. Okay, output is going down. Okay, prices are going down some. Prices are going to be going down 10%. Actually, let's make velocity going down. You know, let's have velocity is probably going down. Oh, maybe 5%. Okay, we got minus 25% decline in total nominal spending. We've got maybe 10% deflation. What do we have to have here? Maybe about a 15% decline in output. Okay, so This is what's going on. Massive aggregate demand shock here in the form of a monetary collapse, combined with a little bit of a velocity shock. And that shows up partly in deflation, but partly in a decline in output. Remember, it can't show up totally in deflation. In the classical world, that kind of money shock wouldn't matter, maybe. It would be something like this, minus 15. Well, let's just do this, a total uh, MV shock of minus 25. Uh, that could give us minus 25% inflation and no change in output. Okay, Or it could give us, let's move this up here, Okay, delta MV. This was minus 25. This is what we're seeing in the depression. In the classical world, shoot, why can't we just see 30% deflation? and keep our 5% output growth. Why can't we see 30% deflation? We will see big deflation. We'll see 10% deflation, but all of that change can't be in the form of deflation. Okay, Remember, because there's different kinds of goods that have to deflate. Land. Can land deflate? Yeah. Labor and capital. Can commodities, can raw materials deflate? Absolutely. Okay, can consumer goods deflate? Yeah, consumer goods can deflate. Our consumers love falling prices, right? Can labor deflate though? No, sticky prices downwards, 
it's very difficult to get uh, nominal pay cuts. Labor cannot deflate. Okay, labor cannot go down. Capital, capital's yeah maybe it's kind of iffy. Maybe some capital can, some capital can't. Okay, we want to focus on labor being the sticking point. Okay, so wages can't go down. So the deflation can only be part of the adjustment, and that implies the rest of the adjustment has to be in real output. Okay. So what's going on in the Great Depression in the 1930s is primarily a massive monetary shock. Okay, and let's go ahead and put this back into our dy dynamic aggregate supply and demand framework. We'll start in 1929 where everything's hunky-dory. We've got aggregate demand growth, oh, maybe something like 4%. And we've got our long-run aggregate supply here. In the economy, we've got a lot of uh, technology being developed, a lot of investment happening in the late 1920s, and our growth rate's really strong at 4%. And that's where short-run aggregate supply and long-run aggregate supply meet here. Short-run aggregate supply in the solo curve. And if we've got 4% total nominal spending growth, all of it's being used up by real output growth, that means what? 0% inflation. And this is actually what we have. This is 1929. What happens to, towards the end of 1929? Well, a series of aggregate demand shocks. Starting with maybe the stock market crash, which is a confidence shock. So we go, have aggregate demand declining like this. That's our first shock. That maybe kicks off our investment shock. By themselves, and a lot of economists like Milton Friedman say, oh, by themselves, these probably would have caused a mild recession. The U.S. economy seen a lot of mild recessions, probably would have had a, a nice quick recovery, wouldn't have been that big of a deal. Okay? There was actually a, a steep depression in 1920, 21, but the economy bounced right back. Okay? There's been lots of uh, short, steep depression recessions, the economy bounced right back. But what happened next, and this is where Milton Friedman really... Um, makes this case about the decline in the money supply is that we add on top of these other little aggregate demand shocks we add this massive shock this massive decline in aggregate demand in terms of the monetary shock the big drop in the money supply let me extend out the short and aggregate supply curve and what we have is something like a 23 percent drop in aggregate demand. It's similar to those numbers I just showed you. What, is, what are we going to see here? Where well, We're going to see something like about a minus 10% deflation. And to equal up, a minus 13% decline in real output. Okay, minus 13 plus minus 10 equals minus 23. Okay, and why is it largely in the form of output and not just in the form of prices again because short and aggregate supply slopes up due to the sticky wages effect okay this is now this is a very simplified explanation mind you but this is generally how most economists like to view the great depression and again if we go back if we go back to this data this data bears it out really well okay here at the depth of the depression in 1932 we see about a 23, 24% decline in aggregate demand. Total nominal spending, about, in GDP terms, it's about 12% of its deflation, about 13% of its decline in output. Okay. In other words, this checks out. This completely jives with our aggregate demand, dynamic aggregate demand, aggregate supply framework. And when we look at that monetary shock, which is a big aggregate demand shock, that jives with our basic Keynesian explanation of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm.